December 1984, Cumru Township, Pennsylvania. The body of a strangled woman is dumped in a ravine. For 20 years, the case of Jane Doe lies dormant until a cop and a psychic join forces. I started to see lines of light across a map, and I saw the Brooklyn Bridge. Can a psychic's map locate a killer and solve a 20-year-old murder? Cumru, a small township in rural Pennsylvania. The solving of the Jane Doe case began in an unorthodox way, with an inquiry into the unrelated homicide of a local man. Murder is an unusual occurrence in this community. More unusual is the fact Detective Robert Warner, for the first time in his career, is going to meet with professional psychic Lauren Thibodeau. She has been working with the dead man's family. That's why Warner is here, hoping to find some answers. I figured I'll use every tool I can to solve a crime. And at this point here, I figured I had nothing to lose. So let's go down and talk to Dr. Lauren and see. Despite his optimism, Weiner is not about to go advertising the visit just yet. At that time, I didn't know how people would react, so I kept it to myself. In fact, he didn't even tell Lauren his reason for the visit. I didn't say anything about that case when I first walked in. She didn't even know I was a police officer. Um, I walked in and sat down, and she knew I was there for a reading. And actually, Dr. Lauren said, asked me if I was in law enforcement and if I was a police officer, and I said yes. As Warner hadn't identified himself, there's no way Lauren could have known he was a cop. That's when she said, well, you're working on two cases, and one of them's very old, like put on a shelf for many years. And I was only working on one at the time, so uh, I first said, no, I only have one case. I said, no, there's two cold cases here, two. And he said something like, well, I only have this one, but keep talking. So, so I did. This lady's crazy. <laughs> I'm here for one I can't stop. <laughs> but, uh, yes, uh, at first it was like, no, no way, you know, but... When you hear something like that, it's always on your mind now for the rest of the reading. You're picking your brain trying to figure out, oh, what is she talking about? What is she talking about? And then I remembered this other case that we had that I wasn't even working on, and I told her I wasn't working on that, but um, she said that that's going to be being worked on. She sees that, she sees, actually saw that one being solved. So at that point there, uh, it, I was excited. The second case that Lauren referred to was an unsolved homicide dating back to 1984. That year, as residents of the small community of Cumru Township prepared for the holidays, a body was dumped on the outskirts of town. Discovered two days before Christmas, the victim had been strangled and meticulously bound with rope. She was wrapped in a green army-style blanket and wrapped again in a paint-splattered drop cloth. An autopsy revealed that the woman was about 30 years old and had a history of abusing drugs. Forensic investigation, which was still in its infancy, revealed no clues to the killer's identity. With no means of identification, the victim was referred to as Jane Doe, a standard police procedure in the U.S. She was buried in a local cemetery. At the time Jane Doe was murdered, Lauren was a young woman at college living in a different state. Warner was blown away by the fact that Lauren had any inclination about the case. She's talking about the two cases that we have, which floored me. For her to even say that, how does she know that we have two cases? Um, and one's been sitting on a shelf for 15 or 20 years. And that's when I contacted her the following day. It was in that phone conversation that I started seeing green little lights traveling across Route 78. It was as if I was looking at a map of New Jersey, New York, and Eastern Pennsylvania. And as it moved across, I looked upward, sort of upward toward the Brooklyn Bridge. And I, I could feel, you know, and even smell the, the energy of the city and, and 
that we were dealing with, you know, New York. Lauren was not only able to give a sense of place, she was also able to give some clue as to the killer's occupation. And I remember asking Detective Rob if the one of the people that they thought it might have been could have been a truck driver because I was shown that this was somebody who would have, I kept seeing the side of a cab of a truck. So at this point here, I, I thanked her and left to go with that. I still did not have the case. A few months later, my sergeant had pulled the case out and put it over on my desk and told me, you know, since you're going to be here a while, you might as well start working on this and, and see what you can do with it. Two months after Lauren predicted it, Warner was assigned the Jane Doe case. The other case, the murder he went to see Lauren about in the first place, remained unsolved. But for now, Warner focused on the unidentified woman's case. Lauren had also envisioned a truck driver, and sure enough, one of the prime suspects in the original investigation was indeed a truck driver. Back in 84, there was a truck driver that was going around, uh, picking up young ladies with reddish brown hair, strangling them, and dumping them out of his truck. After they were able to capture the truck driver, he admitted to all the ones that he did. He said he was not in Pennsylvania. There was no way of proving he was in Pennsylvania. Uh, so we knew it wasn't him. Uh, the actual ligatures were tied differently. Uh, at that time, there was no connection. Did Lauren get it wrong? Was her vision of the truck driver the man who had already been cleared in the case? Or was she right? Was the woman's murderer simply a different truck driver? And the big question, where was the killer right now? Cold cases are notoriously problematic. Memories fade. Evidence becomes contaminated. Witnesses die. You got to understand, when the first time that this information came up, I didn't even know Jane Doe's name. Without the victim's name, there was virtually no chance of ever nailing the killer. But there was one positive to working a 20-year-old crime. Forensics technology had come a long way in the last decade. When Detective Robert Warner started investigating a local murder in Cumru Township, Pennsylvania, he never expected to be hurled back 20 years to an unsolved homicide. Professional psychic Lauren Thibodeau predicted that Warner would be working on an old, unsolved case. Now he was. The case of Jane Doe, a woman who had been strangled, tied up in a blanket, and dumped over an embankment. Basically what it was was it, it got it fired up in me. Um, and I think my sergeant, when I came back and told him after the reading I had the first time with, with Lauren um, about the two cases and so forth. I think it kind of all just went together. Lauren's vision of the Brooklyn Bridge clearly indicated a New York connection to the case. There was also the map highlighting Route 78, and she sensed that the murderer was a truck driver. As to how psychics see visions, they're all different. Many people see it visually. Others perceive it in a telepathic, auditory way. Others get a real gut sense, you know, they literally have a gut clench. Many people have what I call sort of a field feeling, like from the skin out. They have, you know, the tingles or something. So there are at least four different ways people perceive it. Warner's first challenge was to put a name to the victim. The 1984 autopsy had revealed that the woman was a drug addict. 20 years on, could this help the police find her real identity? Warner reckoned there was a reasonable chance that she had a criminal record. If that was the case, her fingerprints would be on file. APHIS is the national database of all criminal fingerprints. It didn't exist when the woman was murdered in 1984. Warner submitted her fingerprints, and sure enough, she had been arrested on a minor drug offense. Match gave me Margaret Calciano, 
and Margaret Gravasi. Gravasi was, was Margie's married name. She was married for about a year in the 70s. So with those two names at that point, I have a computer system where I can go in and I can type in the names in the certain states. And I typed in Brooklyn, New York, and typed in her married name, and I didn't come up with anything. I come up with a few Gravasis. I tried calling, and no one knew Margie at that point. So then I took her maiden name, which was Calciano, entered that in to my system, and came up with probably 250 names in Brooklyn. And the first name I called was her mother. He says, uh, do you have a daughter named Margaret? I says, yes. I says, who's calling? And he says, I'm a detective from Pennsylvania. <clears throat> and um, he says, I hate to tell you this, Miss Calciano, but we found your daughter in 1984. And I says, okay. I says, what do you mean found her? He says, well, she was murdered. For 20 long years, Joan Calciano lived the fear and dread only a mother can comprehend. The sheer horror of never knowing if her daughter was alive or dead. Now, finally, the wait was over. It was a relief because at least I knew, you know, in my, I knew in my heart she wasn't alive, but I didn't know where she was. You know, and a lot of things go through a mother's mind, you know, and I just thank God she was cut up and never been found and or buried and never been found. And, you know, just so many things went through my mind. But uh, I miss her. You know, she was such a beautiful girl. She could have had anything in life. Yeah, but that was it. Here's a woman who lost her, lost her daughter 20 years ago. And she said the last time she saw her was December 19th, 1984. And she got into an argument with her, slapped her on the face, and she ran out the door, and that was the last she saw her. And it haunted her ever since that that was the way her and her daughter split. The next day, Warner and his partner drove to Mrs. Calciano's apartment in Brooklyn. She welcomed us in, and there were friends and family members there. And we sat around the kitchen table, and we showed her photos just to make sure that she could ID and say that, yes, that's my daughter, showed her photos from the autopsy. You know, and we had to ID it, and it was her. And uh, it was hard, you know, to identify her. And then we got down to brass tacks, and we asked them who was involved in this. He asked me if I had any idea who killed her, and I said yes. And I gave him the guy's name. With this information, could Warner find the killer? For almost 20 years, the file on an unidentified female murder victim lay dormant. The Cumru Township Police Department had reached a dead end until Detective Robert Warner met with professional psychic Lauren Thibodeau. Spurred on by Lauren's visions and with some good old-fashioned police work, Warner was able to identify the woman as Margie Calciano, Margie's family were able to identify who they thought was her killer. All of them said without a doubt, Peter, and they gave his last name of Iosa. Uh, Peter was last seen with her. He was, from what the family at that time had told us, he was fatally attracted to her. He would get upset if she was with someone else. Um, he was quite older than her. He was 20 years her senior. He was obsessed with my daughter. And uh, I knew that he had killed her because he disappeared the same day she did. And that was December 19th. He was supposedly was a very hothead. Uh, he would snap and, and, and he slapped her around before. She was doing coke and uh, he was giving her money to buy it. And when she needed money, you know, he gave it to her. And he swore nobody would ever have her, you know. And, he made sure of that. Yeah. So we kind of had a good feeling that this was a, that he was a good good suspect. Um, when we left, uh, we just didn't know how to find him. Uh, we returned back to our station the following day, and um, 
I started working on it, and I couldn't find the last name of Peter Iosa anywhere in New York. Uh, I couldn't find it anywhere in the United States. According to the Census Bureau, there are 555,864 Peters living in the United States. All Warner has to do is find the right one. And all he has to go on are Lauren's visions, a truck, the map with the beam of light, and the Brooklyn Bridge. Warner calls Lauren. I remember talking to him by telephone not long after about this situation and getting that very visual movie feeling. As he was describing things that he knew about this case, I, I began to see imagery of a truck driver. Not a big guy, this one. I didn't get a sense of big hulking. You know, on the slender side, definitely a smoker. And I remember seeing the white door of a truck opening and as if I was looking over the shoulder of the driver stepping out. A, a thickly quilted uh, sort of plaid, uh, like a flannel, thick flannel shirt that you might wear instead of a coat in, in wintertime. Definitely felt like winter to me. I, it was very clear that we were at a, a crisp, cool, um, almost like could smell lake water near it. And we were at a truck stop somewhere near water and i guess in this case it would have been the great lakes that region would be on the way it's almost like a psychic profile of him i do feel he's a, a repeat killer certainly um a lot of sexual violence you know rape assault that sort of thing the revelation that this might be the work of a serial killer as opposed to a one-off crime of passion up to the ante for Warner. He was now in a race against time. We have to get him. We need to get him off the street. If he's killed once and he's going to do it again, and how many has he done in between? Um, it's like any law enforcement officer, anyone actually, that you know, you want to get this guy off the road, off the streets. He's, he's a danger. Um, there's not a female around that's safe as long as he's out there. In an attempt to get Pete's last name, Warner phoned Joe Dresick, an ex-boyfriend of Margie. And he said that he didn't know the name, but he knew that Pete had filed a complaint against him one time, and that the police may have it on record if they'll find it from way back then. So at that time, I contacted uh, New York PD, gave them the information that I had, and they were able to come up with a report and fax it to me in a couple of days, and it came back with Peter Williams. Warner used William's social security number to track the fugitive. He discovered Williams was drawing welfare checks in Milwaukee, and he had been a truck driver, just as Lauren had predicted. One of his main routes had been Brooklyn to Wisconsin, which would have taken him past the Great Lakes. Once again, Lauren's visions proved to be uncannily accurate. With Lauren's help, Warner has gotten this far. He has a name. Peter Williams, and a face. But has he got the hard evidence needed to convict the man who believes murdered Margie Calciano? At any given time, there's well over 20,000 women missing in the U.S. Margie Calciano was just another statistic. And for 20 years, she didn't even have a name. Were it not for the collaboration of Detective Robert Warner and professional psychic Lauren Thibodeau, the chances are Margie would have faded into history as an unidentified victim. The combination of psychic intervention and solid conventional police work produced a prime suspect, Peter Williams. When I first met Pete and I walked up to him, I advised him who I was and the reason why I want to talk to him, and the blood drained from his face. You could see him just literally turn white. He was just pale, and it became quite nervous. He said the last time he saw Margaret, took her to a methadone clinic, and she got out of the car, and that was the last he saw her, and he said he washed his hands of her. And those words, when he said, I washed my hands of her, made the hair on the back of my neck stand up. Um, he... Uh, 
he said he didn't deny it being intimate with her, but what he did deny was killing her. Weiner needed more than suspicion to nail Williams. He needed hard evidence, and he had it. When he took on the case, all the evidence was resubmitted back to the lab. Improved forensics technology revealed a single hair embedded in the army blanket used to wrap Margie. To prove it belonged to Williams, he needed to get a DNA sample. He felt like he had that licked because he wasn't denying having sex with her. What he was denying was killing her. So he was willing to give us the DNA samples. He didn't know we had the hair at that, at that point. And after the fact, when we, well, prior to leaving, I basically had told him flat out that we felt he's the one that did this. We knew that he probably wouldn't stay in Milwaukee long, and he didn't. He left a few weeks after we were there. The DNA analysis proved positive. The single hair embedded in the blanket that encased Margie Calciano matched the DNA sample taken from Williams. When we arrested him in Tucson, uh, he looked at it. He didn't say a whole lot. He didn't say he wasn't, wasn't guilty at that point. Um, what he said was um, he read the probable cause and saw the hair. And I think that's what floored him. I think he realized that he, he had it at that point. The DNA profile of the hair recovered from the green blanket matched the DNA profile of Peter Williams. Based on your affiant's investigation, Information that your affiant has received in the DNA profile results which were received from mitotyping technologies matching the recovered hair from the green blanket wrapped around the victim and the DNA profile of Peter Williams, I'm requesting an arrest warrant be issued for the suspect, Peter Williams. Thank you. You don't have to. Huh? Couple of mistakes. Oh. Same couple of mistakes. Peter Williams was charged with first degree murder and taken back to Pennsylvania. A month before he was due to face trial, Williams died of cancer. Once again, he had cheated the scales of justice. I wish we could have gone to trial because I, I would have rather him been found guilty by a jury. It would have been better for the family and friends that way. It would have been a definite closure. I felt I was cheated um, when he killed her and not knowing where she was, although she is. And then I wanted to see his face in the courtroom. I wanted him to see me, and which I felt like I cheated again, you know? And it was hard. I mean, I, I felt very bad. I broke down and cried because I didn't want it to go that way. I wanted him to see me, but it didn't work. So naturally, I felt I was cheated again, you know? When Margie Calciano had been positively identified, at the request of her mother, her body was exhumed. Today, she is buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, just blocks from her mom's home. And it was funny because when we were up in Brooklyn, we're sitting, and I'm looking at the Brooklyn Bridge, and that's when it dawned on me and I started thinking about all the things that Dr. Lauren told me that fit. Even though prior to that, I didn't, it didn't sink in and I, I wasn't using it. But after I sat there and thought about it, I thought, okay, the Brooklyn Bridge, I just went down the line and all the pieces started fitting in. I think where people get stuck is that it's psychic and it must be somehow bigger or more magical than something else, and it's not. It's just a different way of getting information. You'll get bits and pieces of information. It's all fragmented. And what you have to do is, it's like a puzzle. It's like a jigsaw puzzle. And you have to sit down and try and place these things into your case. Uh, once you sit down and you can pop in all the pieces, you'll solve your crime. I would say the best attitude for success is one of very practical, if this can help me solve a case, I'll use it. Right? It should be seen as a tool, not as a solution to a case. Psychics do not solve the crimes. The police do that. Where we have help, I think, is sorting out the wheat from the chaff. Would we have solved the case if I didn't go to Dr. Lauren? Um, it's kind of strange how things work. It's like it's meant to be, you know? It's like things happen for a reason. 
Every suspect is innocent until proven guilty. Because Williams died before going to trial, nobody can say for certain if Peter Williams killed Margie Calciano. And there's another twist to the story. Again, because there was no trial, authorities are not allowed to submit Williams' DNA to the national database. So other police officers trying to solve other cold cases will never be able to cross-check Williams as a suspect. So we may never know for certain if and how many times he killed.